After she was acquitted in 1847, Sarah Chesham came back to Clavering to live with her family. Unfortunately, some people in the village thought that she'd got away with murder and they would shout Sally Chesham at her in the street. It didn't help that the papers were suggesting she was friends with Mary May, who lived on the other side of the county. Even today, that journey between Wicks and Clavering would be quite arduous, and it's very unlikely they even knew each other existed. Edward Ball, would li Edward Ball, Edward Ball would listen, wrote a book called Lucretia. He get Lucretia, which was about a poisoner. After, of course, Lucretia Borgia, the famous Renaissance poisoner, but also giving her the surname Clavering, tying in the village that Sarah's residence with his book which these days he'd probably be sued because it would have jeopardised her trial. So poor old Sarah had to deal with the people being quite suspicious of her. Her husband died in 1850 and the doctor thought that it was tuberculosis, but there were certain people in the village who really weren't having that. Various items were taken away from her house for testing and um, an autopsy performed on her husband did show that he died of TB, but Professor Taylor found 1 25th of a grain of arsenic in his stomach. Now that's really not enough to kill anybody, therefore she couldn't be um, condemned of murder. It was, however, considered attempted murder. She was sent to the Easter Assizes in 1851 in Chelmsford once again. And here she had no defence. It seems quite shocking that someone could be on trial for such a serious um, crime without any defence. The, prosecutor, the prosecutor's evidence um, revolved around various people who lived around this um, village who said that Sarah had come back from her original trial implying that she'd actually got away with murder. The other evidence was a bag of rice which Professor Taylor said was completely full of arsenic. Now this bag of rice was actually belonged to Sarah's father. She was very reluctant to see it leave the house and people thought that was because she poisoned it she didn't want them finding out. But of course she was recently widowed. If she was short of money she wouldn't want to see a big bag of rice walking out of the house. Poor Sarah was found guilty of attempted murder and although sometimes um, the sentence for that could be transportation, in Sarah's case it was execution. But at the same assizes Thomas Drury was found guilty of murder himself in a case that bears some parallels with the very infamous um, Red Barn murder in Polstead some 20 years earlier in Suffolk, um, he had murdered his lower class lover who he'd got pregnant. He and Sarah were executed side by side. People were far more interested in Thomas Drury with his case full of lashings of sex and death which of course fascinated the Victorians as much as it might fascinate certain people today. When Sarah was brought down from the scaffold. She wasn't buried in the precincts of the jail, unlike Thomas Drury, because for attempted murder there was no, uh, there wasn't the need for them to be buried there as part of the sentence. So Sarah's son Philip rattled through the country lanes from Chelmsford to Clavering with his mother's remains in his, in his cart. She was buried somewhere in this churchyard without a service being read over her. Just as in life, rumour surrounded Sarah. One, one rumour was that on the way home, her, her family had been accepting money in exchange for people getting a look at her body, and that using all that money, they'd got themselves hopelessly drunk. Well, to be honest, after going through what they had, I don't think any of us could blame them for wanting to have a drink. Another rumour that was printed in a London newspaper was that someone had come into the churchyard, found where she was buried, dug her up and stolen her body. The local papers obviously thought that was quite ridiculous. But here we are in Clavering, where the poison panic started and also where it ended. <laughs>